welcome James and Denise into our Sunday morning church. We've had a conference for the weekend. Let's give them a big welcoming hand. Thank you. Come on up, James. Father, we just thank you for James and Denise coming here, and we just say, Father, that we give them the welcome of this house, and we just say, our house is your house. We love you in even just the few short days we've spent together, and we just say, please share with us everything that God puts on your heart to share with us today, and we receive it. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. It's been great changing over to an iPad from notes. <laughs> I want to read to you something that um, Derek Prince wrote. It was in his newsletter in 1998. I think it was his March-April newsletter. I don't know, do you know who Derek Prince was? Uh, I think, I personally think he was one of the greatest um, Bible teachers of the last century. Uh, and um, I know in New Zealand a lot of his teaching is still being listened to every morning on the radio. Um, he has um, lots and lots of like 10 minute or 15 minute pieces and he really, he really seemed to be able to explain in very simple terms um, a lot of the basic and foundational truths that we, we all walk in. Um, I'm not sure just exactly how old he was in uh, 1998, but I think he was in his mid-80s, something like that. And uh, in, his, in this newsletter that he wrote, um, he describes an experience that he had in 1996, uh, where he came to experience the Father for the first time. And, you know, I, I know that Derek Prince had um, really studied the scriptures for very intensely for a long time prior to that. He gave, gave his life to the Lord sometime in the 1940s, I think the mid-1940s or 46, 47, something like that. But he says in this that I'm going to read to you that he had been a Christian for 50 years when uh, he had this experience that he talks about here of the Father. And one of my questions that I had to the Lord, and I asked him, but he never answered me, he still hasn't. Um, why did it take Derek Prince 50 years to come into a revelation of the Father? And uh, the only thing I can think of in that is that it's the timing of the Lord. And we are living in a timing of the Lord today where he is taking another giant step forward in giving revelation to his body. And we are just experiencing these things at this time. And Derek and his experience was because of um, the timing of the Lord and what God's doing in the world. You see, sometimes when we give our lives to the Lord, we kind of have this ex or, uh, expectation or perspective, I should probably say, that the Christian church basically is a static thing that we have to adjust to. That the church itself has the truth of God, the word of God, and, and all of the things that are happening in the body of Christ are basically what they are. And when we give our lives to the Lord, we have to change to fit into and to assimilate and understand and begin to walk our life as a Christian. And it's kind of like we, we would, um, if we looked at it in this kind of picture, like we book into the hotel of Christianity. And now we've got to learn how to live in this new environment. And, uh, and so we, we get challenged to change in many areas of our life. Particularly when we first come to the Lord, there's lots of challenges of things that you need to come out of the world. You need to come away from the things of the world. And so we, we make those decisions and we, we lay our lives at the Lord's feet and we, we come through what we'd call consecration. We consecrate our life to live this new life and leave behind anything that's not a part of it. 
Um, and the goal kind of is to become the mature Christian, the, the person who really has the run of the hotel, you know, really knows how it all works and, and come into some kind of maturity. And so we think that maturity is kind of, uh, you know, when I know the Bible pretty well, um, I've basically adjusted my life to let go all of the sin issues in my life, or at least the major ones, and I'm working on the others. And, uh, and then we maybe, you know, become a regular churchgoer and become part of the whole system of church and maybe have some ministry in the church, maybe financially supporting the church or, and other ministries as well. And so we become the regular churchgoer and the regular Christian and we've kind of achieved a level of maturity. And so now all we have to do is to keep on going in our beliefs, have some ministry or some input into others and just keep doing this until the day we die and then we go to heaven because we reach the stage a stage of you know relative maturity within the body of Christ but you see the, the, there's a problem with the picture and the picture is that we don't book into a hotel it's like we get into a ship that's going somewhere because Christianity itself is developing and moving forward throughout history and God's purpose in, in the church is for us, all of us, to come to be the perfect image of Christ himself. That the life of the head becomes the life of the body and we become like Jesus, not just personally, personally as well, but not just personally like Jesus, the body of Christ becomes the image of Christ himself. And so God is moving through history to develop the church and to give to us what we need to, with his final goal, which I have to say he is absolutely determined and intent on focusing on that he's going to reach this goal. And that is that the whole church becomes like Jesus. How the work of God gets done is not by effort, sweat and determination or goals or projects or plans. God's church is built as he reveals himself. And when he reveals himself and we see him more as he is, our seeing him more as he is changes us to be more like him. The scripture says we shall be like him when we see him as he is. And so the work of God is to reveal himself and he does it bit by bit. And so when we look back in the history of the church, particularly say we go back to the time of the disciples, the disciples had an incredible revealing of who God is through the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Now say Jesus of Nazareth because for most of their time with Jesus, they didn't really understand who he was. It wasn't until just before he was crucified they finally got it, that he actually came from God. We see that in John 16 verse 30. He said, now we believe that you came from God. And the next thing that happens is the Garden of Gethsemane, the cross, and his crucifixion. After Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples now come into a much greater realization of who this Jesus is. And so they go out with this absolute revelation that Jesus is the Son of God and everything that he said in the past now comes back to them with a different perspective. And so they begin to live their lives of taking this, this message of Jesus Christ is the image of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And Jesus came to die and take away our sins so that we can walk in an intimacy with Yahweh as Father. That was the position of the disciples. However, when we look at what happened over the next few hundred years, we see from the time the apostles died, the revelation of Christianity declined decade after decade after decade, until finally within three to four hundred years, the realization of what Christianity really is was getting lost at its most basic level. People were losing the capacity to understand the baptism of the Spirit. People were losing the capacity to understand being born again. And so slowly the revelation of Christianity went downwards into what we know now as the Dark Ages. And one of the things that has struck me is I wondered, when they had such a perfect picture of Jesus, why did their Christianity decline? Why didn't it go upwards and increase? But in fact, it went downwards. You see, a lot of us, I think if you're anything like me, you would have wished that you could have been alive when Jesus was actually walking the earth and see him face to face. What an amazing thing that would have been. However, it wasn't enough 
to build the church and for the church to grow and go forward. The church basically declined into religiousness, traditionalism, and an understanding that to get to heaven you have to be a very good person, Old Testament perspective, and you have to give money or you can buy your way into heaven. And so for a thousand years, or in a thousand years, the truth of Christianity was almost completely lost, but traditional living kept at least the scriptures current. Then around about the 13, 14, 1500s, we begin to see the church getting new revelation. In the midst of this darkness, God began to give revelation to some individuals of who Jesus really is. And we hear about the people called the Anabaptists and the Hutterites and different people from the past that began to see Jesus is salvation. They didn't see Jesus as Savior in the sense we might talk about it, but they saw Jesus is salvation. And that's one of the mistakes that we can often make in our own minds. We can think, I made a decision for Christ and therefore I became a Christian. You, you don't become a Christian because you make a decision for Christ. You make a decision because you get connected to salvation itself. That's how you become a Christian. And Jesus becomes real to you. And when Jesus is real to you, then you get born again. And see, this revealing was beginning to happen in the 13, 14, 1500s to certain individuals, and then it increased and increased. And we, people we hear about are like the people called the Moravians, who came to the Lord through a man named Jan Hus, or John Hus, we would say in English. There was another man named um, Joseph Men or Menno Simons, who was the founder of the Mennonites. Um, and so different people began to get a revelation of Jesus as Savior, and the church began to come into new life out of the death of the Dark Ages. And slowly different ones began to see, and it was like God was beginning to reveal himself to different individuals that they would get born again, and then they began to preach it. Now the most focused person that we see in all of this would be Martin Luther, but he was really the only one, I mean he was much later on in the piece. The others before him were the ones that really were the pioneers of this, what we call the Great Awakening, or we call it the Reformation, when the church was being reformed and God was beginning to come out of this dark ages and to build his church again in a new era. And from that time until this, the church has been growing in revelation, understanding, numbers, authority, in every way, in wisdom. It's been growing and going forward and increasing decade after decade, century after century until today. And it is still going forward. It's still growing. The church is coming to know the Lord much more intimately and with much more detail and much more understanding and wisdom. And so when you look back and think, why didn't it grow when they had a perfect revelation of the Father in the man, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God? Why didn't it grow from that point? Why did it decline when they saw a person that was perfect? The only thing I can see is this, the only explanation I have for this, is when Jesus' words, he says, Blessed are those who believe without seeing. More blessed are those who believe without seeing than those who believe when they've seen. And the disciples all believed because they saw the miracles of Jesus. They saw the person. They looked into his eyes. As John says in his first letter, they gazed upon him, they touched him, they handled him. But that was... And then, and then they came to believe. But for us, we cannot touch him, we cannot see him, we cannot gaze upon him. We have to believe without seeing. And so as we come into this Christian life and we begin to believe on the Lord, then we discover on believing that we see. You don't see to believe, you believe and then see. And so as we come to believe, then the Lord reveals to us himself, but what he reveals to us is the risen Christ seated at the right hand of the Father, revealing the Father to us. And so the church has been growing since particularly around the 1500s as God began to pour out a revealing of himself into the hearts of people about who Jesus is, first revelation. Because Jesus is the cornerstone. There is no way into the kingdom except through Jesus Christ. He is the door. 
He is Savior Himself. He is the Lord. He is the way. He is the entrance for us to come into anything of God. There's, there's no way we can come into anything of God except through Jesus Christ. And so when we get born again, it's really Jesus is revealed to your heart and you meet him in your spirit. You touch the reality of who Jesus is deep inside of you. And it's fantastic. The sky can turn blue in the moment that happens because suddenly your eyes see with the eyes of the Lord. And so when you get born again, it's a revealing of Jesus to your heart. He comes into your heart and the deepest reality of who he is is revealed to the deepest reality of who you are. And you say, I met the Lord. I know the Lord. Because in your spirit, deep in your heart, you know that you know him. I remember my father saying to me one time, when I said to him that I'd met the Lord, he said, what do you mean? Did you see him? Did you smell him? Did you touch him? Did you taste him? You know, I said, no, no, no. I said, he said, well, if you didn't see him or touch him or hear him or feel him or anything, how do you know you know him? I said, I don't know how I know that I know him. I just know that I know him. Yeah. Deep inside, my spirit had met him and it changed my life. And you see, you begin to be a Christian when that happens. But then in the 1900s, the early 1900s, God began to reveal something more of himself. And we call it the Pentecostal revival. We call it the, the Pentecostal move of the Spirit. This great revival that hit first in Wales. Actually, it first hit in Norway in the, in the early 1800s and late 1700s when there was a man who was actually, never forget his, his birth date because it's the same as mine. <laughs> And his name was Jan Helga Nilsson. And he began to preach all over Norway about the baptism of the Spirit speaking in tongues. He was jailed many times for his, for his preaching, but he came out and just carried on. And so there was this move of the Spirit where God began to reveal something more of himself. This time he revealed the Holy Spirit to the church. And in the 1900s, particularly through the Welsh Revival and then through the revivals in Azusa Street, in, um, just down the road in Pasadena in California, God God began again to open the windows of heaven and show to us something of God himself and that changed the way we live our lives. It changed our whole perspective of what it means to be a Christian. It changed our whole perspective of what it means to go to church and what church life is. God reveals himself and it changes everything. The work of God is basically finished. When God made, finished the day of creation, it says God finished and he rested from all his works. He's not really doing anything else anymore. He just reveals what he has already done to us. When Jesus died on the cross, he said it is finished. His work was finished and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And when he sat down at the right hand of the Father, see there's nothing more that God needs to do for us. But what he does is he reveals who he is and what he's done to our hearts. And when that happens, we change. And he is going to keep on revealing himself until the whole body of Christ is the perfect image of himself to this world. The latest thing that he's been doing in revealing himself in these days, he's revealing himself to the church for the father that he is and for the love that he has for us. And this is changing the church again, taking us on into a new step forward in the development of the body of Christ to become the image of Christ himself. It is so important for us as individuals to experience the father as a loving father to us, touching us with his love because God is love and as he touches us with, our lo with his love it takes us to another level of experience of God. Now interesting whenever God has revealed himself to the church as he's revealed himself to us it has changed our perspective of scripture. We've come into a much greater understanding and insight and revelation and being able to see what the Scripture is really talking about more when he reveals something of himself. See, if you go back to the theology there was before the Moravians, before the Anabaptists, back into the like a thousand years after Jesus, 1100 AD, you go back to the theology then, people were preaching some really weird stuff because they didn't know that you could be born again. And so they had trying to work out how then do you get to heaven? They knew there was a heaven that the Bible talked about it. See, they had the same Bible that we have, basically. 
but they couldn't see what was written in it because they needed revelation. The Bible is a book of revelation. You cannot understand it except God gives you revelation. And when he does, then you see it everywhere. I mean, how many of you tried to read your Bible before you were a Christian? Boring. <laughs> and I tried too. I read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not even realizing it was the same story three times. <laughs> because you just can't see it. It's like there's a veil over our eyes. But when you get born again and read it, Jesus is on every page, right? Right through. Then you get filled with the Holy Spirit. And suddenly the Holy Spirit's on every page. I mean, how did I miss it? Now he's revealing himself to us as Father. It's like the Father's on every page. You see, every time that God moves, our understanding of Scripture takes a leap forward until what's finally going to happen to us is the understanding of Scripture is going to be perfectly revealed to us when we are like Jesus. Jesus understands it perfectly. Yeah. There's no darkness in him. And so we are living in a time today, you know, this is not just some little thing that's going on in the body of Christ. We are living in a time today where God is revealing himself in a way that is unprecedented since the time of the disciples. He's revealing himself as Father, as a part of the ongoing development of the church until we all can become to the image of Christ. And so when I was asking the Lord about Derek Prince, you know, why didn't he get a revelation of this a long time before? Why was it 50 years after he was a Christian? Because of all the people that I know, I think Derek Prince applied himself to understand the scriptures almost more than any other person in our era. And he came to deep understanding. You know, when somebody can talk about complex things in simple words, you know they really know what they're talking about. If you ever hear someone preaching and you're not sure what they're talking about, well, probably the preacher isn't too sure what he's talking about either. <laughs> because when you really understand something, you can speak about it clearly and simply, and 10-year-olds should understand what you're talking about. So what Derek Prince said was this. In 1998, in his newsletter, writing um, about 1996, he says, My understanding of God as Father was revolutionized by a personal experience early in 1996. Just take the words. His understanding of God as a father was revolutionized. This is not a simple word. He's saying, my concept, perspective, and ideas of who God the Father is was completely blown out of the water and replaced by another completely different perspective. It was a revolution. You know, we know what a revolution is. It's when the whole power system of a country is overcome by somebody else rising up and kicking that power system out of power and taking power themselves. This is what happened to Derek Prince. A whole different perspective of God the Father took over his life. Wow. He says it happened through a personal experience. So this was not, he was reading the scriptures and suddenly saw something more in it. There was a personal experience that he had that changed everything in the way he thought. See, you will always think according to the perspective of your heart. A lot of people think we need to keep away from our hearts because our hearts, if we're thinking in Old Testament thinking, our hearts are desperately wicked. You can't trust your heart. But God's given us a new heart, of course. We know that. But a lot of people think you can't trust your heart. But what you can trust is logic. Many people make that mistake, but your thinking, your logic, will be influenced tremendously by the state of your heart. If you've grown up, for example, in a house where you have an angry, violent father, then when you begin to read the Bible, if you become a Christian, all of the words of God being angry and violent will absolutely ring bells for you, and you will see that and have that perspective. God also is Father. The word father to you, without your thinking about it, will probably mean anger, violence, and fear. And so if you come to the Lord with that of having affected your heart, and you begin to read the Bible, all you'll think of is, God the Father must be anger, violence, and my part is fear, but Jesus is safe. Or you might have had a father who was just 
perfectly plastic and looked exactly like every Christian should, but it's, a, but it's just a picture. He's just playing the game, he's acting it out, he's living his whole life playing an act of being the good Christian. And he's very, very good at it, but he lives by the book and raises you by the book, rather than raising you through love from his heart. And you grow up thinking that you've got to live by the book. And God wants you to live by the book. And so your whole perspective of Christianity will be, I just do what the book says, and I will live a Christian life. Right, one problem with that. The best Christians we know in history never read the Bible. The disciples. They did not live by reading the New Testament. You ever thought of that? They never read it once. They didn't even know it was in it. They lived their Christian life following something other than the book. They wrote the book, for goodness sake, <laughs> out of the experiencing of God that they had in their life. And so, see, our theology will be influenced by the things that have affected our hearts and our life. And we will see Scripture according to that. You know, I, I've always been a person who loved logic. Mathematics was my best subject in school. I, I got to say, I loved mathematics because it's so sequentially logical. And you just follow the list of things. But the one thing about logic I've discovered in the years gone by, you can have a perfectly logical train of thought and can't see any fault in it and think you must be absolutely right because the logic is perfect. And then somebody throws in a fact you didn't know. <laughs> And suddenly your logic stream is blown right out of the water because now you've got one fact that you didn't have before. What you thought was foolproof was actually deeply flawed. The Apostle Paul understood that when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. A new fact was thrown into his life and it blew everything he had before out of the water. We are influenced by the experiences we have, not by the logic that we're taught. And so when, when Derek Prince says here, my understanding of God as Father was revolutionized by a personal experience. He's saying the experiences we have ultimately are the things that affect our walk with God. The Bible, in fact, is just a book of people who had experiences and wrote about them. He goes on to this, he says, and I don't want to talk about the experience, it takes too long, but it was a physical experience for him. He says, immediately, without any mental process of reasoning, I knew I could call God my Father. Wow. Like, in an instant of time, he has an experience that gives him a knowledge that he didn't have before. Now he, we'll see in a minute, he knew God was the Father, he'd been a Christian for 50 years. He'd prayed the words, Our Father who art in heaven, for a long, long time. He knew that, but he didn't know the Father until this experience came. And he says, immediately after this experience, without any mental process of reasoning. Now, Derek Prince had a very good mental process of reasoning. But he said that was completely bypassed in this instant. He says, I had used the phrase, Our Father, for more than 50 years. Doctrinally, I was clear about this truth. He goes on to say this, and I love the humility. You know, one of the things I love about Derek Princeton, I don't trust anybody who doesn't look like they've got something wrong with them. <laughs> you know, I remember Jack Winter used to say to us, or said to us one time, but I heard him say it many times, never follow a person who doesn't limp. You understand the inference? When Jacob was fighting the angel, and he came out of that with a limp, and the strength of his life was broken. And it says it was a new day. He had a new day, name. And he had a new walk. He walked with a limp from that time on. And Derek Prince walked with a limp. His faults, things that he did wrong, that he confessed publicly and brought back out in the open, just to me, make him a man of God. I've discovered something about people in my life. I've discovered this. If anybody looks like they're perfect, that's exactly what it is. It's a look. <laughs> he says here, I had even preached a series of three messages entitled, Knowing God as Father. Isn't that great? 
<laughs> He's saying, I knew doctrinally that God is our Father. He says, I had even preached a series of three messages entitled, Knowing God as Father. In other words, he presumed to teach people how to know God as their Father. For 50 years. And he didn't know God as Father himself. But you see, the thing is, he didn't know that he didn't know. He thought that he knew God as Father because doctrinally he was clear about the truth. Because biblically he knew and he could put the scriptures together and he could teach about knowing God as Father. But he didn't know that he didn't know God as Father himself until he met him. Yeah. See, one of the biggest mistakes in the body of Christ today is that we have been told and we sometimes fall into doing this to tell people, just read the word, believe it, and it's yours. Let me tell you, it is not true. The Bible talks about experiences that you can have, but you need to come into those experiences, not just know the Bible says them. The disciples never read the New Testament. They didn't stand on a New Testament verse and believe it and assume that it was theirs because they believed it. They came into an experience. Like, for example, where Paul says in Romans chapter 8, I read it the other day, Therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk every day in the Spirit of the Lord. A wonderful verse. Where did Paul get that teaching from? It's not in the Old Testament. Jesus didn't talk about it. It's nowhere else in the Scriptures. Where did he get that belief from? Where did he get that idea from? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk every day in the Spirit of the Lord. Where did Paul get that idea to write that? Simple. He was walking in the Spirit of the Lord one day and suddenly realized, my goodness, this is amazing. I'm not feeling any condemnation. There's no sense of guilt in me at all. I feel like I am completely and absolutely acceptable by God in everything within me. There's nothing that he would point a finger at me to condemn me. I feel completely free of all guilt. And so he says, when you're in the Spirit of the Lord, there is no condemnation. And see, we can read the verse and think, the verse says that, so I've got to believe it and stand on it in his mind. And so you're fighting this feelings of guilt because you don't want to feel guilty. You're fighting this feeling of inadequacy or not being good enough or not acceptable to God. And so you keep quoting the scripture thinking that quoting the scripture and standing on its truth is going to get rid of your guilt. You've got to come into the experience Paul came into where he's walking in the spirit and it was natural for him not to feel any sense of condemnation. See, all of the scriptures, when the, when the Apostle John says, God is love, where did he get that from? One day, it must have been that John had an overwhelming experience of God and just got loved out of his boots. And just got overwhelmingly aware that God loved him with absolutely no reservation. And as he came into that experience, he wrote one day, sometime later, God is love. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not anywhere else in any other teachings, anywhere else. John had to have written that out of an experience that he had. And those experiences are for us to have as well. Not just to believe that they're ours as an act of believing or trying to believe. Love is something that we are to come into. And Derek Prince says it exactly here. He says, I had even spoken or taught a series of three messages entitled Knowing God as Father. The problem is, he thought that knowing what the Bible says was having what it's talking about. He thought that reading about what it says about knowing God as a Father in the Bible, if you understand what the Scripture says, then you have the relationship. And then 50 years later, <laughs> he has the experience of the Father's love and suddenly everything in his life changes. And he says it became, he goes on to say here, from that morning it became natural for me to address God as Father or my Father. 
from that morning forward, it became natural for me to address God as Father or my Father. In other words, exactly what it talks about in Galatians 4 verse 6, out of your heart, when the spirit of sonship falls into us, out of our heart, we say, Abba. Papa, it just comes out of your mouth because what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. You know, sometimes I hear people praying, and I'm not criticizing this because praying is really, really a good thing to do. But when you pray, your relationship with who you're praying to is exposed. And sometimes I hear people praying, they say this, they say, Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, that you love us, dear God. And I think, now hang on, Jesus isn't our Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love me, Father. Jesus isn't the Father. You think, who are you talking to? Well, you talk to who your heart knows. But sometimes your words will be fashioned according to your theology because you want to say it right. You know, because I travel in this revelation a lot, I often meet people and they say to me, um, yeah, it was wonderful to have Jesus, I mean, the Father with us this morning in the church. It was wonderful that Jesus, our Father turned up. And I know they're just using their words to make me happy that they know the Father, but actually their relationship of intimacy is Jesus primarily. That's wonderful. It's not wrong. It's wonderful. But Jesus did say the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You know, there's some... some um, um, a song today that I can't sing that we sing in worship. You know, I don't know what it's going to do to your song. You, know, you probably don't sing it either. But it says, all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. Yeah, you know, I don't believe Jesus believes that. I think if you ask Jesus, he would say, no, it's not all about me. It's all about my Father. I came to glorify my Father. I came to speak my Father's words. I came to show you what my Father is like. The miracles that I did were to show you what my Father, how he feels about people who are suffering and people who are sick. Jesus' whole life was to glorify his Father. We, we get caught up. I mean, it's wonderful that Jesus is real to us, but we're living in a day today where God is opening the windows of heaven and revealing the Father to us. And when that revelation, as with Derek Prince, when that revelation touches your heart, your heart will automatically say, I worship you, my Father. I love you, my Father. Just as in Jesus. You know, the Apostle John was the closest one to Jesus, as we know it, as a disciple. The Apostle John was the one who didn't even want his name to be used. There's a lot of people who want to make a name for themselves today. It's the wrong tree, you know, it's the wrong life, it's living, going the wrong path, it's the ambitious path. But people, it's, a, it's the orphan way. Orphans don't have a name, they want to make a name for themselves. John went the other way, he didn't even want to be called John. He said, just call me the disciple that Jesus loved. He just wanted to be known as the one whom Jesus loved. He was so close. He was the one leaning on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. And Jesus told him who the one who would betray him was going to be. And he didn't tell anybody else of the disciples. Do you remember? Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And John, who was leaning his head against the chest of Jesus, whispered to him, who is it, Lord? And Jesus said to him, it's the one who puts his bread into the wine after me. And Jesus reached out and put his bread into the wine. Immediately Judas Iscariot did the same thing. And John knew what was going to happen. No one else did. John was so close to Jesus. He was probably the youngest of the disciples. He was the last one to be alive. All of the others martyred. But in the latter portion of his life, he said these words. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead and the Spirit of God came and fell on Pentecost, the love of the Father filled John and John's heart shifted into relationship with the Father as the primary focus because of Christ's work on the cross. And from that time on, John became the one who saw the relationship of Jesus with his Father more than anybody else. In John 17 verse 3, Jesus himself said, This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, speaking to his Father, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. The Apostle John understood it. You read the first few verses, first three verses of his first letter, 
John, 1 John chapter 1. And you see that John talks about his whole life with Jesus in very brief terms. We saw him, we gazed upon him, we watched him, we touched him, we fed from the bread, bread of life. And he said, and, and we share what we saw with you so that you may have fellowship with us. And then he says those words, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see, we're coming into a day today when this is becoming real for us. Because I, I remember in, in my life, earlier Christian life, my whole understanding of Christianity was Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I would have sung those songs just as vehemently and as zealously as anybody else. But now, as I've seen the Father and come to experience his love for me, I realize that the core issue of the gospel is that Jesus came to take away everything that stands between God the Father and us so that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, climb up on our Heavenly Father's knee and experience him loving us. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. In other words, he comes, a mediator comes between two estranged parties, right? Two people that cannot get on. A mediator comes in between and talks to both parties and does something in between, works with the both parties and does something to bring the two parties together. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. When we sinned, it separated us from God. Jesus came to bring us back to him. The disciples understood it so easily, so simply. They had this Jesus the carpenter, son of Nazareth, who seemed to have a hot line to heaven. He did the miracles, but they knew Jesus has connection with Yahweh. That's what they saw. That's all they saw. They couldn't figure out really who Jesus was. Is he a teacher? Is he a prophet? Is he just a miracle faith worker? You know, what is this Jesus? No one ever spoke like him before. And they were battling to discover who he was. And his whole three years with them was to reveal to them so that they would finally get it that he actually came from Yahweh to this earth. Later on they wrote, he is the mediator between God and man to bring man to Yahweh. But Yahweh, Jesus revealed, is actually Papa in personality. Fantastic. We are taking a leap forward today into a realm of Christianity that has been lost through the dark ages and now God is rebuilding his church. And he's going to keep on revealing himself to us stage after stage after stage until we come into the fullness of the expression of the Son of God. We are the sons of God. Jesus is our oldest brother. Now, sometimes people see Jesus as being this, like the King of Kings and we have to worship the King of Kings. Yes, we are, but we need to realize we are not citizens of the kingdom. We are a royal family. Jesus is our brother. He said to Mary, after he rose from the dead, go to my brethren and tell them that I have risen. He said to them, I am going to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. We are living in an era of time today where the ship, if you like, is going into a new realm. And Christianity is taking a step forward. When that happens, it's always the case that there are people who are fast adopters and then there are people who are slower. I think the ones that are, you know, like in, I said the other day, in the technological world. In the technological world of today, it's not so important what you know. It's what is important is your ability to relearn, drop things you have known and relearn to know new things. And the same is happening when God gives revelation to us to drop things that maybe we thought were right in the past, but now we are open to see afresh how that fits. It's a new era of the kingdom of God. As I finish, I just want to, say, to read one verse to you. In Matthew 11, verse 27, Jesus says this, All things have been delivered to, my, to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. That's a really interesting insight into the life of Jesus of Nazareth. He says, nobody actually knows the Son except the Father. He's really meaning, no one knows me except Yahweh, 
my father. You know, I, d I discovered, I've, I've got a doctorate in um, one particular aspect of humanity. <laughs> I think I've got a doctorate in loneliness. <laughs> I, I have lived with loneliness in my early life to the level where I'd hallucinate out of the need for people in my life. The need for knowing people. I used to think, though, that loneliness was when you don't know anybody. But you know, you can actually know a lot of people and still be terribly lonely. Some of the loneliest people in the world live in cities. Loneliness is not when you don't know anybody. Loneliness is when nobody knows you. You see, when no one knows what it's like for you to be alive in this world, when nobody knows what it's like for you in your life, then you live on a planet with nobody else on it. And that's where loneliness is. Loneliness is broken when you can share your heart with somebody else. Doesn't matter where they are in the world, once you share your heart with somebody and really they get to know what it's like for you to be alive, then loneliness goes. But see, Jesus, he says, nobody knows me except my Father. And your Father in heaven knows you too, perfectly. But you can still be lonely, even knowing God. And knowing that he knows you, doesn't take loneliness away. God looked at Adam and said it's not good for the man to be alone and yet he had God every day. Perfect person every day. Loneliness is only broken in us when another human being knows what it's like to be us. So Jesus knows what loneliness is. He said no one knows me except my father. He's saying my mother doesn't know me. My father Joseph didn't know me. Nobody in, my, in Nazareth knew me. Nobody really understood. Then he goes on to say, and nobody knows the father except the son. And this is one of the reasons they crucified him, because he was saying, like this carpenter's boy from Nazareth, who was actually an illegitimate child in their thinking, had been conceived outside of marriage. So they're thinking, this boy should never have actually even been allowed to live. His mother should have been stoned. The moment they discovered that she was pregnant. That was the law of Moses. And so they were being very lenient even to allow him to be alive. And now, having never probably even finished primary school, never grown up and gone to any university of religion in, Jew in Jewish times, he says to these people who have been studying the laws of God since they were two and three years old, like Samuel was, Living in the temple all of that life, he now and now they're long haired, grey haired men with long beards, and now this upstart guy who's just turned thirty, which is in our thinking or their thinking, he's only just become allowed to be a man in the world. And he says to them, Nobody knows Yahweh except me. He's saying to all these long bearded guys, You don't actually know him at all. I do. I'm the only one. They were so offended. The problem was, you see, he was performing miracles that nobody could do unless God was with them. Yeah. And so they had found it very difficult to argue with them. And when they did try to argue, he turned it back on them and made them look stupid. Yeah. And so they really were upset with him. But the, the, the issue is, this carpenter from Nazareth was telling the truth. Yeah. He didn't know about Yahweh. He knew Yahweh, his father. He had intimate, personal connection, heart to heart. And they just had knowledge. And it's a problem in the church today even. Our knowledge can convince us that we know Yahweh or the father, even when we don't actually know him at all. And so when Jesus says here, no one knows the father except the son, he's saying, I'm the only one that knows the father. And he was right. He was the only one who knew the Father. But he goes on to make another wonderful statement following that. He says, no one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Yeah. In other words, he's saying, I can reveal the Father to you. Yeah. And you can know the Father like I do. You don't have to have all the years and years of university study like the leaders of Israel had. I can reveal the Father to you so that you will know him personally and intimately 